All right, welcome back, everybody. Happy Friday. It's getting, just in case you're not as weather aware as I am, it's getting cold today. So some of you I see, like this guy here, are not ready for that. You might want to go home and change out of those shorts because there might be some cool temperatures today. So, but what we're gonna do today is fun, um, warm. Uh, the goal today is to connect what we talked about on Monday with what we talked about on Wednesday. And I'm hoping, so you know, one of the pleasures of teaching a class like this um, a couple times is that you start to realize, you know, deficiencies in what you've done before. Don't tell any of the CAs this. They all think that, you know, 125 was a perfect class that was handed down, you know, directly uh, from, from the mind of a god or something like that. But there are things in the past that I haven't always explained as well as I could, and one of those things is the relationship between Java references and polymorphism. And this is something actually that allows both concepts to make more sense. So that's our goal. So we're gonna do a little bit of review to start off, to set the scene, go back, talk a little bit more about what polymorphism is. We'll be a little bit more specific about it now when we talk about, you know, we're gonna stop using these weasel worlds like objects can morph into other kinds of objects. That doesn't really make any sense. Instead, what we're gonna say is more accurate, which is that if I have an object of a particular type, I can get a reference to that object of that type or of any of its supertypes. And which way I refer to an object has implications uh, that we'll try to tease out as we go along. Okay, so, back on Monday we talked about the fact that, you know, and this goes back and there's a little bit of inheritance review as well. So in Java, every class extends another class, except one. Capital L object is the ultimate parent of ancestor of every Java class. But every one of the new types that we add to Java's type system through this class declaration syntax inherits from something. Even if we don't explicitly extend another class, we implicitly extend object. And so object is up there at the top. Everything, object is up there by itself at the top. Everything in Java extends object. Um, and then here was an example of how a particular subset of the Java class hierarchy might be organized. And the idea is as we go up, things get more general. And we'll talk about this again at the end of the class when we talk about how poly polymorphism works. So the idea is that object is supposed to only contain capabilities that Java wants every single object in the type system to have. So for example, to string is something that's provided by object. I want, it's useful to be able to print off any type of Java object for debugging and for other purposes. And there's a couple of other methods that we also inherit from capital O object, equality. So every class is expected to have some notion of equality, what it means for two instances of that class to be equal. That's something that when you design the class you get to provide, right? So object has all this general stuff, and then we, as we go down the tree, what's happening is things are getting more specific. So we're breaking things into smaller and smaller categories. So there's some subset of Java objects that we can think of as representing characters. That's a pretty small subset, actually. There's lots of different types of Java objects. You guys are working with some on, on the machine project. Those have nothing to do with characters. Think about all the different types of data, all the different types of entities that we can represent in our computer programs. Characters are a tiny, tiny little subset, okay? So already by going one, you know, level down the tree, we're talking about a much, much more specific set of things. But even among characters, there are divisions. There's different kinds of characters. So I'm dividing these into digits and letters, right? And you can imagine that those different characters might have different capabilities. So, for example, every character uh, might have a certain uh, type of capability, but digits and letters might have different ones. And then I can further subdivide letters into vowels and consonants. If you're talking about a particular language system, other language systems might have different subdivisions here. Um, so again, as we're going down the tree, you know, we're breaking things into smaller and smaller categories. Java's class system is categorical. Everything is an object, but then some objects are characters and some are not, right? And if there was another, like a string over here, right? Some objects are strings and some are not, okay? Some characters are digits and some are letters. According to this diagram, those are your only two options. 
Now again, that may not be exhaustive. You may need to have other classes over there. And then some letters that are not digits are either vowels or consonants. Again, that may not be fully exhaustive. But as we go down, we're splitting things into smaller and smaller categories. And I'm gonna come back and talk about this at the end of the class, but one, th one thing I want you guys to notice is, as we go down, we know more about the object that we're talking about. Putting something into a category means that we understand something about it, right? Once I take a character and I uh, determine whether or not it's a vowel or consonant, whether or not it's a letter or a digit, that requires knowing something more about that character. So as we go down, we're obtaining more information about the object that we're working with. But we're working with a smaller and smaller subset of, of the overall object tree. So again, some tiny fraction of Java objects or characters, some fraction of those characters can be considered to be consonants, but those consonants themselves represent a tiny fraction of Java objects. So as I go down, I gain more information, and I can be more specific. As I go up, I gain more gener generality, but I lose information. When I get to the object level, I don't know anything about that Java object. It could be a character, it could be a string, it could be a pet, it could be one of the uh, main activity classes you guys create for your MP, who knows? All I know about it is uh, just a couple things. I can call toString, I can call hash code, I can call equals. There's a few of those methods that everything has, okay? So, as a reminder, some of this I'm gonna go through quickly. If I don't extend another object, I extend object. Everything extends object. And so there's this small number of methods that every object in the Java object system is going to have. And again, go back to what we just said. These are methods that have to work for any kind of Java object. Any type of data that you can think about working with, any type of, you know, entity in your program that you want to represent using a Java class has to have these features. And so whatever we put on object has to be extremely general. Okay? Everything has to be able to support this. There are certain things that objects, and we'll come back when we talk about interfaces and look at uh, certain things that Java objects don't provide, because not every class can support that, right? But the things that are on Java objects are things that everything has to be able to do. So every Java object can return a string representation of itself. We've seen the fact that that string representation is not always that useful, it can do that. Every Java object can compare itself to another Java object. By default, that comparison is not very useful, but you can make it more useful by overriding the method in your class. And there's this thing that will become a lot more fun once we get to maps at the end of the semester. Every Java object can return an integer that's supposed to be a unique representation of its contents. We'll see why that's helpful later. Normally, the default versions of these that are provided by capital o object are not very useful, and so when we design a class, we override them. We override to string, we override equals, we override hash code, and we make them work in a way that's appropriate to our class. So when you design a Java class, you get to decide what it means for your class to be equal to another class, another object. Sorry, for two instances of, for an instance of your class to be equal to something else. What does that mean? It's up to you. You get to write that method. Okay, so when, so this hierarchy is used by Java when it tries to find variables and methods to either access or to call. So when you use dot notation, this is what's happening. You're telling Java, you know, look for a method or a variable with this name, and the way this works is Java starts, and we're gonna, we're gonna see this in a minute. So Java starts at the type indicated by the reference that you are using. This is what's important. This is the connection between references and polymorphism, and, and we're gonna make this a lot more clear in a minute. So it starts with the reference type, and it says, does the class have a variable or a method with that name? If it does, that's what gets used. If not, I look in the parent class. This whole search, and I, this is a little bit inaccurate, this whole search is also guided by these uh, visibility modifiers. So if you have a private class named toString, it doesn't get used when I call object toString. That has to be public so that I can call it outside of your class. So the visibility modifiers also guide the search. And essentially I just keep going until I either find a method or a variable with that name 
or I don't, in which case it fails. And this is a compile error. This is not a runtime error. The compiler will actually tell you, you know, your code didn't compile because you told me to call this particular method using dot notation, and I couldn't find it, right? It didn't exist on your class or in any superclass, right? So, you know, and we talked about this before, so here, and, and now we can be more specific about this. So now I'm creating an instance of my sweet old dog class here, and I'm saving it in a reference variable called choo-choo that stores references of type sweet old dog, right? And then I essentially print choo-choo, and I don't, you know, I, I don't explicitly have to use two string here. I can get rid of that. This is gonna work the same way. Print will call two string for me. So what happened here? So when I called to, when I called to string, when Printlin called to string on this object reference, it started in sweet old dog and it said, does sweet old dog provide a two string method? No. Then it looked in old dog, then it looked in dog, then it looked in pet, then it looked in animal. And finally in animal, it found that two string method. And of course, we remember that if I got rid of this two string method, or let's just mark it private, actually. So if I mark, eh, okay, now it's gonna be mad at me. Let's change the name instead. Now I don't get that method that I just defined because it gets skipped. I'm not calling it using the right name. So now what I'm getting is the default object to string method, which is not very helpful, All right? Okay, good. So polymorphism we talked about was this ability for objects to act differently depending on the context in which they're being referred. And this is something that makes a lot more sense once we start to talk about references, once we understand references, because references are what determines the context in which I'm using a particular kind of Java object. So what's really, you know, what it's really, we're gonna talk about interfaces next week. And interfaces in Java are actually really cool. And it's a nice extension of the Java class system that I hope will make it more clear exactly what we're trying to accomplish when we organize our objects into a hierarchy like we do in Java. Okay? But in, now here I'm being more specific, okay, than I was the first time we talked about this. So I want you to see this. Can be referred to. So essentially what this means is that in every, if I create an instance of an object in Java, for every object other than capital O object, I can use two different types of reference variables to refer to that object. One is the type of the class itself. So in this case, if I created a pet, I can save that in a reference variable of type pet. I can refer to it as a pet. But I can also save it in a reference variable of type object and refer to it as an object. And how I refer to it has consequences in terms of what I'm allowed to do with that reference, which methods I'm allowed to call, okay? So every pet can be referred to as an object, every dog. Now, if I extend another class, then I'm adding different ways I can refer to that particular type of Java object. So a dog can be referred to as a pet or as an object, okay? So here's, so, and, and when I, when I take a Java object and I wanna use it as one of it, I, I wanna save a reference to it that requires casting up the tree. So for example, here I'm creating a a dog, and I'm saving it as a dog, and I'm creating a pet, and I'm saving it as a pet, but when I pass them to print anything, I'm, print anything is taking an object. And Java's doing that for, that me automatically, okay? This is probably a better, let, let me show you it this way, okay? So I can do this, so now on line nine, I have a reference variable of type dog, called choo, -choo. and it's storing a reference to an instance of type dog that I created on the right side, okay? Then on line 10, I'm creating a reference variable called ziz of type pet, and I'm using it to store a reference to a new instance of type pet. When I pass those to print anything, Java is automatically taking that reference and casting it to an object reference. Now both of these classes extend or extend through inheritance object. Everything extends object. And so that's okay, so that can happen automatically. So again, this is sort of equivalent to, let's, let's uh, draw this out a little bit better. Object choo-choo as object is equal to choo-choo. Object is, 
object is equal to ziz, I can call them this way as well. Oop, I need to be able to spell. This will work fine. Okay. Now, one thing we pointed out about this example last time, and I know I know we're going through these a few times, that's okay. It's just slippery stuff. I guess I want you guys to see this a few times, have a chance to ask questions, and so this can start to solidify in your mind. Because this is tricky. You know, pr from a programming perspective, is this hard? No, it's not. But this is one of the, uh, this next week, I would argue, is probably one of the trickier conceptual parts of the class. We're thinking about objects, their relationship to each other, how we refer to them has implications for how we use them and things like this. This is, this is tricky stuff. So even though the code doesn't look hard, there's no algorithmic challenge here, there's a conceptual challenge going on. Okay, so what am I doing here? So on line nine, I'm saving a reference to an instance of dog in a variable that saves a reference to dogs, and then I do the same thing on line 10 except with pets. And then on line 11 and 12, I upcast those references to objects. So I'm creating a new reference variable called chuchu as object, and I'm using it to store a reference to chuchu. Now that's gonna be the same reference as, it's gonna, re sorry, it's gonna refer to the same object. There's only one dog that I've created. Remember, if I don't see new, I haven't created a new object. So I've only created one dog, okay? I've only created one pet, but now I have four different references. Choo Choo is a reference of type dog, pet is a reference, Ziz is a reference of type pet, and then I have Choo Choo as object, which is a reference of type object, and I have Ziz as object, which is a reference of type object. So now I'm passing those object references to my print anything method. So that's essentially what happens if I call print anything and I just pass it, you know, Choo Choo and Ziz directly. So this is sort of what's happening behind the scenes. Again, I should get rid of all of these spurious two string calls. That's gonna work fine. But here's the thing to remember. Even when I pass a reference of type object to this method, clearly Java still remembers that Choo Choo is a dog. It knows what class the object reference actually refers to. It knows this is the class type because it's finding the two string method that I overrode in dog. So this is the thing that's tricky. The reference determines, we're gonna see this in a minute, the reference type determines what methods I'm allowed to call. But the instance type is still used when resolving those methods. So even though I have an object reference here, I'm not getting the default object two string implementation for dog, for the dog reference, for the object reference that I pass that actually refers to an instance of dog, okay? All right, and again, this is sort of what this slide says. Instances retain their types, so I still know what type they are, okay. So then we talked, uh, you know, then I just wanna point out that I can also downcast instances. So on line nine, I'm creating a dog on the right side, but the reference that I save it into on the left side is a reference of type object but Choo Choo still refers to a class that has type dog. And so if I want to later, I can downcast Choo Choo to be a pet. Or sorry, yeah, downcast. So I, could, uh, I can create a new reference over here called Choo Choo as pet, that's of type pet. This is a reference variable. And I'm taking my object reference and I'm downcasting it. So the upcast will happen automatically. I don't have to do an explicit cast, the downcast does not happen automatically. I have to put an explicit cast here on line 11. And the reason is that this can produce a problem. This can produce a runtime error if the downcast is incorrect, right? So let's see, let's make sure this works. If I do, you know, so I created, I have an object reference on line nine. I downcast that to a pet. I can do that because Choo Choo is still, is a dog, and so he can still be referred to as a pet. And then on line 13, I downcast all the way to a dog, which I can do because Choo Choo is a dog. Okay, so let's change this a little bit. What's gonna happen now? So we'll run the code in a minute, but let's just think through what's going to happen here. 
on line nine, I'm creating, what, what type of object is being created here? Okay, remember, when you, whenever you ask that question, you look over here. You look at what's to the right of new. That's the type of object that's being created. I may refer to it in a variety of different ways, but the type of object that's being created is a pet. It'll always be a pet. It's never gonna change. I've decided to refer to it as an object on line nine. So that is doing an automatic upcast. It's taking what is returned from the constructor, which is a reference to a pet, and it's upcasting that reference to refer to an object, which I can do because everything extends objects. Okay? Now, on line 11, I'm downcasting that to a pet. So I have my object reference, and I want to refer to it as a pet. We'll talk about in a minute why I would want to do this. Is this going to work? Is the object actually a pet? It is. It's still a pet. That's what was created on line nine. Where is this going to fail? Yeah. Yeah, so right down here, this is where I have a problem. So up till here, I'm fine. But now, I'm trying to refer to this pet as a dog. And I can't do that because dog extends pet. So I can't create something that was created as a pet and refer to it as a dog, okay? Let me, let me give you an example of why. Let's imagine that my dog method has a, we're gonna come back and see this later. Let's imagine that my dog class has a method called woof, which prints to the console, okay. All right, and now, here's what I'm gonna do. Let's call choo-choo as dog dot woof. Okay. So I added this method, this woof method, to my dog class. Pets don't have a woof method. Not every pet can woof, only some can. Okay, so now let's go back and replace this with a pet and see what happens. As promised, I get this runtime error, a class cast exception, and it's being generated by on line 16 when I perform this cast. Because I can't take something that I created as a pet and now cast it into a dog. One of the problems with doing this in this example is that my pet objects don't have a woof method. So I can't call woof on them. They don't know how to woof. Only dogs can woof. Questions about this before we go on? This is the kind of places where things start to get a little slippery. Okay, let's go on. So Java, so you might wonder, how do I do this safely? Right, I just saw an example where something broke. Java provides a way for you to test whether or not a class is of a particular type. So I can say instance of, if, uh, you know, Choo Choo is an instance of, you know, instance of will tell me essentially if that an instance of a particular type of, 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 of class, okay? Now, one thing I wanna point out, all right? Let's replace this, so I did this last time. Okay. Yeah, so this is a compiler. Because the Java compiler is actually smart enough to figure out here that Choo Choo was created as a dog, even though I'm referring to it as a pet. But Juju has no relationship with strings. And so the compiler will actually fail here. So the compiler is still helping us. The compiler can actually suss out certain relationships between classes. I don't want to go into this in too much depth because it's, it's subtle. But, um, but in this case, I'm actually getting the compiler, which is what I want, right? Now, if I use dog, I'm gonna, it's gonna work properly. The idea is if the compiler knows that Juju can never be an instance of a particular type, it won't even compile my code. It'll just, you know, generate that error message and force me to fix it. Okay. So we've been using this terminology, but again, just some quick review of reference variables. So we're gonna, now we're gonna refer to these variables in Java that store objects as reference variables because what they actually store isn't the object itself. It's a reference to the object. References, and again, this is review from last time, but these are, this is like, this is probably the worst day of the class, conceptually, right? This is tough stuff. So, 
References are a way to get to something, but they are not the thing itself. So we talked about some examples of references last time. One was a phone number. The phone number is not the phone. I can make lots of copies of the phone number. I don't have more phones. Every one of them refers to whatever phone rings when you call that number, okay? Street address, you know, which might refer to a house. I only have one house. I can give out lots of copies of my address. The address is a reference. The house or the physical location is reality. Same thing with GPS coordinates you guys have been working with. Those are a reference. You know, like this spot on Earth has GPS coordinates. It's, the GPS coordinates are not the spot. They're just a way of referring to it. They allow you to get here. They don't, you know, and also there's a bunch of different ways of referring to this spot. I could use a different coordinate system, for example. Social security numbers, you guys are aware of these. I mean, your life is now sort of um, in many ways defined by some of these references. You guys have an email address, right? An email address is a way that people can send you mail. The email address is not you, it just refers to a particular email account. All right, so now here's where we're gonna bring these two ideas together. Polymorphism and reference. Because now we're gonna be really crystal clear about what's happening when we're creating Java objects and saving references to them. In that statement, so if I look at the statement on line five, okay, dog choo choo is equal to new dog. It's a new sound. How many types do you guys see in that statement? We started to learn how to recognize Java classes. They start with a capital letter. I've got a couple of class declarations right up top. I think this is the heat coming on, because that's what makes it. This is good, it's gonna get cold. All right, in the statement on line five, how many types do you see? Who can point them out for me? Yeah. What's that? Okay, where's the one that you see? Well, but where does, how many times does dog appear? Yeah, sorry, so, so there, how many times do you see something that looks like a type on line five? Right. So I see dog twice. I see dog on the left side of the assignment. That's the reference type. That determines the type of the reference variable that's gonna store a reference to whatever's created on the right side. Then on the right side, I see new, and then I see something that, again, looks like a class name or a type. Now, in this case, those two things are the same, but they don't have to be. Here's an example where they're not, on line six. So now on line six, let's talk about what's happening. So now, I'm creating a dog. I'm creating a new instance of type dog. The instance type is what follows new. It's on the right side of the assignment. And if you don't see new, you didn't create anything. So I've created a dog, but I'm gonna refer to it, the reference type is an object. Okay, so the reference type is on the left side here. So this statement says, I'm creating a variable called ChuChu as object, and that variable can actually store references to any Java object, which is anything, except for those eight primitive types, right? Any Java object. What I'm initializing it to is to store a reference to this new dog that I've created on the right side. So again, now we can be very precise about what's happening. I have an instance type, which is on the right, that determines what kind of object I've actually created. And then I have a reference type on the left. And what that does is it actually determines what types of objects that variable can refer to. So choo-choo, can only refer to dogs or anything that descends from dog. Choo choo as object can refer to objects and anything that descends from objects, so anything, okay? So now I can, I don't have to create a new, um, you know, we talked about reference variables, we said we could copy references. I don't have to create a new object in order to create a new reference variable, so on line seven, I'm now creating a new reference variable called pet. That reference variable can store anything that's of type pet or its descendants, and so it can store choo-choo because choo-choo's a dog. That refers to the dog that I created on line five. 
And then I can also downcast things if I'm doing things properly. So now, choo choo on line eight, so choo choo is a reference variable of type dog. It can't, it has to refer to something that's a dog. The object reference variable that I created on line six actually refers to something that's a type dog. And so here, I can do this safely. Oh, sorry, I don't know what happened here. This is supposed to be on the comment. So this is choo choo is equal to, uh, dog, so I'm downcasting this reference variable. And that's the reason that the downcast is unsafe, because it's possible that that object reference could store a reference to a string, at which point I wouldn't be able to do this, it's going to fail, okay? So, so again, now we're being really precise about this, and I think this is gonna help us. Instance type, the thing on the right side of the new keyword. That's the kind of type of object you actually created, it does not change, ever. Reference type, is the type of the reference variable that we're using to refer to a particular type of object. And that can be the instance type, so if I save, to save something into a reference variable, that actually, the object that it actually refers to has to either be the same type or a descendant of that type. So if I create a reference of type object in the Java object system, I can store anything, any Java object. Okay? So, Here's, so here's where this comes into play with polymorphism. Because in Java, what happens is the reference variable is what actually determines what type of instance variables and methods we can access. You might be wondering, like, who cares? Right, well, here's where this gets cool. Because again, when I create a reference variable of a certain type, the type of the reference variable is what's determining what methods I'm allowed to call. All right, so let's see, uh, let's see an example of this. Okay, so this is from, this is actually from the cover slide, right? All right, so let's go through this slowly. Cause this is, you know, this is a, uh, this is kind of designed to be, you know, a hopefully a good motivating example for this. Okay, so line 18, something that looks very familiar to us. I create a reference variable of type dog, and I use it to store a new instance of dog. Now actually, sorry, I need to go up and review what's happening up top here. So I've actually added some appropriate capabilities to my classes here. So my pet class, I'll talk about abstract in a minute. Um, my pet class has a get owner method. So every pet has an owner. Seems reasonable to assume. My dog class adds a bark method. So it inherits get owner, but it also adds a bark method because dogs can bark. My cat class adds a meow method because cats can meow. Kind of a silly example, but there it is, All right? So, now down here. So on line 18, I create a reference variable called choo-choo, and I create a dog. There is only one object that we're working with through this entire example, and it's created on line eight, and it's a dog. Sorry, it's created on line 18, and it's a dog, okay? Just keep that in mind. Choo-choo never stops being a dog throughout this entire example. The only thing that changes is how we refer to choo-choo. Okay. So on line 18, I create a variable called choo-choo that is referring to choo-choo as a dog. The reference variable is of type dog. With that reference variable, I can call methods that are defined on dog, like bark. I can also call methods that are defined on any of my parent classes. So I can call get owner, and I can call to string, which is what's gonna happen when I run line 21. Printlin, so just in case you missed this, Printlin calls to string internally. So I can call toString before I call printlin, but if I don't, printlin will just take the object reference that call toString for me. So I don't need to do that. Okay, so, so far so good. This hopefully is something that doesn't, you know, is, is starting to make sense now. Right, I can bark, because that's defined on dog. I can call get owner because that's defined on pet, which is my parent, and I can call toString because that's defined on object, which is pet's parent, and so my ancestor. All right. So again, there's only one object throughout this entire example. Now, on line 23, I'm creating a new reference variable called pet. It's called shoot you as pet. It's of type pet. Shoot you is still a dog. The only thing that's changing here is how I refer to choo choo. So because I refer to choo choo as a pet, I can still call get owner. Okay? And I can still call to string. But, I can no longer bark. 
If I refer to Choo Choo as a pet, using that reference, I can no longer call bark. You can see this example is gonna work fine. If I try to run this now, it says, cannot find symbol. Which is weird. Again, Choo Choo's still a dog. Never stops being a dog. There's one object working with throughout this entire example. But because I refer to Choo Choo as a pet, I can no longer call bark. Why is that? Well, let me show you. What if instead of just getting a, uh, using a different reference to refer to my same dog object, I instead have my pet reference, and now I should change the names, but I'm not gonna do that. Choo Choo will be offended that I'm referring to, that he's a cat for a couple of lines, but he'll get over it. Um, my pet reference variable can store a reference of type cat, because cat extends pet. But cats can't bark, right? I can't call wolf or bark on a cat. Now, I can't call meow here either, even though my reference variable is a cat. Sorry, my object is a cat, because my reference variable refers to pet. So the only things I can do with my pet reference variable are things that I know I can do with any kind of pet. And that's stuff that is either defined on pet or inherited from whatever pet inherits from. So in this case, that's two string and other things. Okay, so let's get rid of this broken one. And now let's look at the final instance of this, where I refer to, uh, now I take Choo Choo, who is still a dog. Choo Choo has never stopped being a dog, but now my reference variable, Choo Choo as object, is of type object. And now I can only call methods that I know I can call on any object. So I can't call bark, because not every object can bark. I can't call get owner, because not every object has a get owner method. I can only call two string equals hash code, those kind of things, okay? And again, you know, if I try to put one of these back, you're gonna see I get the same problem. The reason for this is the same as it was a minute ago. Let's say I create a string so instead of my object reference storing a dog, it now stores a reference to an object that's actually a string. Strings can't bark. Strings don't have owners. I can't print them. So that's all I can do. Okay. Any questions at this point before we go on? So again, if there was, you know, last time, we got to the array reference example, and I said, this is what you need to understand to convince yourself that you've got to date. This is what you need to understand to convince yourself that you've got to date. Right? But again, you know, hopefully this brings these two concepts into closer relationship with each other. All right, let me pause here for a minute. I feel like I've stunned people into submission. Questions? about this before we go on. All right, so we've put a lot of cart in front of our horse um, today, but let me talk a little bit about why we do this. Why does, do Java's reference variables and work this way, and why does polymorphism in Java work the way it does? Someone came to office hours yesterday and asked this question, and Wednesday and asked this question. It's a great question, okay? Okay, so here's why. And this goes back, actually, to Liskoff, the Liskoff substitution principle. So the ancestry relationships I established in Java essentially allow the descendant classes to modify behaviors they inherit from their parents, but they can't lose those behaviors, okay? One of you, so, no one has noticed this, yes, but in Java, I can, ex I can override a method that I inherit from my ancestor, but I can't get rid of it. If you are a Java object, there is no way to get rid of two string. You can override it, you can make it do something totally stupid. You could return like null or something and be really unhelpful. But you cannot get rid of two string. Your object will have a two string method. Tough. Like I said, you can break it, you can make it stupid. You know, you can like equals, for example. You can have equals return false. I'm never equal to anything ever. Is that useful? No. Um, can you do it? Yeah. Can you get rid of equals? Can you opt out of the equals program? No. Can't do it. But 
What polymorphism allows us to do is essentially write methods in a way that's as general as possible. And we're gonna take advantage of this later in the class. So when we get to the last part of the class, which is a huge amount of fun, and we actually start designing some simple data structures and algorithms, we're gonna, for example, build a couple of container classes. You guys were frustrated by the limitations of arrays. We'll actually implement something called a list that's a generalization of an array, and we'll do it a couple of different ways to show you some of the trade-offs about how things are actually done internally. When we do that, the cool thing will be that our lists will be able to store any kind of Java object. So anyone, you know, someone doesn't actually have to, you, you could take your list implementation, you could publish it somewhere, and someone could use it. You don't have to know anything about the objects that are stored inside that list, okay? What polymorphism is really doing, you know, we talked about as we go up and down the tree, and I wanna come back to that idea here. This is an incredibly, you know, if I think about the kind of trade-offs that I have to make all the time, that people who work in computer science, experienced software developers make all the time. This is one of the biggest ones. It's generality versus capability. So are you building a system that's gonna work for everything? In which case it doesn't do very much very well. Or it's hard to do everything very well. Or do you solve one specific problem? At which point you might be able to build an extremely, extremely good system for doing one small thing, but maybe it's not doing enough. So this trade-off just comes back over and over again. So the higher on Java's object hierarchy we go, the more types of objects we can work with, but remember, as we go up, every time we go up a class, we're losing capabilities. When we took Choo Choo and we referred to him as a pet, we lost the ability to bark, because not every pet can bark. Maybe I need the ability to bark to write my cool new program. When we refer to Choo Choo as an object, we lost the ability to check Choo Choo's owner, because not every object has an owner. If you were implementing a dog walking application, that would be a problem. Like, how do you get in touch with the owner in case, you know, the dog walker is gonna be late or something like that? So, the more general I can make my methods, the more powerful they are, but I lose all these capabilities. In the, in the you know, most extreme case, I'm working with Java objects and I only have a couple of methods that I can call. Now, it turns out that those methods are actually useful enough to be able to build some cool things, which is what we're gonna do later in this method. As I go down, I pick up more capabilities. So every time I go down a class in the tree, those classes are, are adding things, right? Pat's added the owner property, or the ability to get an owner. Dogs added a bark method. Cats added a meow method. So as we go down, the objects we work with are getting more powerful, but the number of objects that we can work with is getting small. Okay, so again, this is like this instance of a much, you know, a deeper trade-off within computer science. And I would actually argue within, um, within your life in the future uh, in, in general. I have a good story about this in a minute, but I'll come back and make sure that we get. All right, so just the last little bit of Java buzzword class bingo. Um, so abstract. So what does it mean to mark a class as abstract? It means that I cannot instantiate that class. I can extend it, but I can't instantiate it. So an abstract class can never be on the right side of new. So here I've marked pet as abstract. I can't create, actually create a pet. I can only descend from uh, this, that class. This turns out to actually be pretty useful in certain cases. Yeah, so the question was, if an abstract class defines methods, can I use those? Yeah, absolutely. So an abstract class works just the way a normal class does. If I extend it, I inherit all of its behaviors and stuff like that. I just can't ever create one. Yeah. No. You can create an object. You wanna do that? We've never done that before, it's kind of fun. Let's see. Let's create an object. It has an empty constructor. There you go. It's not super useful. You cannot create math. That's a good question. So math is, I think, both abstract and final. Yeah. Yeah, so I can't actually run the constructor. It's private access. All right. Oh, okay, let me, and we might talk about this on Monday, but, um, so someone asked about this before, and I wanna just mention it quickly. So private classes. Someone asked, can I, 
all these classes, because you guys have sort of got used to this, hopefully you're getting good at typing publics, public class, whatever. But I create a private class. So, and the short answer is no. You cannot create a, in Java, in Java, a class cannot be private, okay? Because you'd have the following problem, right? How can anyone use a private class? So in order to use the class, I have to be able to create one. In order to create one, I have to call one of its methods, the constructor specifically, and if the class is private, I can't call any of its methods, okay? Now, here's what you can do. And this is not, well, we're actually gonna use inner classes a little bit in the future, so you will get comfortable with them. Um, but just as a little bit of, you know, mind-blowing stuff before the weekend, Java classes, can define classes inside of them. So here's an example. I have a dog. Inside that dog class, I have a definition for a dog food class. Within my class, I can use that dog food class. I can create it just like it's any other class. This works fine. Um, and I can also mark that class as private if I want to. So for example, if I don't want anyone else to use my special dog food class, I'll mark it private, and this works. Okay, any questions about, oh, okay. I am tired after talking about this, so I can only imagine how you guys feel after listening. Yeah. So the question was, how do static methods work in polymorphism? Well, let's find out. All right, so where do we go? Here's my example. Let's create a public static. Call public stat void. Oh, it doesn't like this. This is my math example. Okay. So now the question is, where can I call whatever? This is a static method. So let's see if I can call it here. That seems to work. Let's see if I can call it here. seems to work, and let's see if I can call it here. Can't do it. So pretty much exactly the same one. Yeah. Great question. Other questions? Yeah. Yep. So you can, ex sorry, you can extend an abstract class. And then you can create a new instance of the extended class. Does that make sense? So here, pet is abstract, but dog is not, right? So I can create a new dog, I can't create a new pet. There are certain, so you might, you know, let, let me actually just say two more words about abstract before we wrap up. You might wonder why, why is this here? So there are certain cases where you actually want classes that store common information about a lot of other classes, but you don't actually want to be able to create them. So a pet might be a good example of this. Right, a pet would store common information across all pets, but to create a pet, I actually need to tell you what kind it is. All right, I will see you guys on Monday. Have a fantastic weekend. I think I had an announcement of some kind. Uh, nope, there it is. Um, remember that we have office hours today till 8 p.m. Um, and no Wednesday office hours from this point forward. I'll see you guys on Monday. Stay warm. <laughs>